So there's an important principle of muscle physiology called the Henneman size principle. And the Henneman size principle essentially says that we recruit what are called motor units. Motor units are just the connections between nerve and muscle from a, in a pattern that staircases from low threshold to high threshold. What this means is when you pick up something that is light, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle energy in order to move that thing. Likewise, when you pick up an object that's heavy, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle connectivity and energy in order to move that object. I'd now like to shift our attention to how to use specific aspects of muscular contraction to improve muscle hypertrophy, muscle growth, as well as improving muscle strength. There are a lot of reasons to want to get stronger. And I should just mention that it's not always the case that getting stronger involves muscles getting bigger. There are ways for muscles to get stronger without getting bigger. However, increasing the size of a muscle almost inevitably increases the strength of that muscle, at least to some degree. Reasons why most everyone should want to get their muscles stronger is that muscles are generally getting progressively weaker across the lifespan. So when I say getting stronger, it's not necessarily about being able to move increasing amounts of weight in the gym. Although if that's your goal, what I'm about to discuss will be relevant to that, but rather to offset some of the normal decline in strength and posture and the ability to generate a large range of movement safely that occurs as we age. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we just tend to lose function in this neuromuscular system as we get older and doing things to offset that has been shown again and again to be beneficial for the neuromuscular system, for protection of injury, for enhancing the strength of bones and bone density. So there are a lot of reasons to use resistance exercise that, that extend far beyond just the desire to increase muscle size because I know many of you are interested in increasing muscle size, but many of you are not. So there's an important principle of muscle physiology called the Henneman size principle. And the Henneman size principle essentially says that we recruit what are called motor units. Motor units are just the connections between nerve and muscle from a, in a pattern that staircases from low threshold to high threshold. What this means is when you pick up something that is light, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle energy in order to move that thing. Likewise, when you pick up an object that's heavy, you're going to use the minimum amount of nerve to muscle connectivity and energy in order to move that object. So it's basically a conservation of energy principle. Now, if you continue to exert effort of movement, what will happen is you will tend to recruit more and more motor units with time. And that process of recruiting more neurons, more lower motor neurons, as if you recall from the beginning of the episode, these lower motor neurons are in our spinal cord and they actually dump uh, a chemical, acetylcholine on muscle, cause the muscles to contract. As you recruit more and more of these motor units, these connections between these lower motor neurons and muscle, that's when you start to get changes in the muscle. That's when you open the gate for the potential for the muscles to get stronger and to get larger, if that's what your goal is. And so the way this process works has been badly misunderstood in the kind of online literature of weight training and bodybuilding and even in sports physiology. The Henneman size principle is kind of a, a, a foundational principle within muscle physiology, but many people have come to interpret it by saying that the way to recruit high threshold motor units, the ones that are hard to get to, is to just use heavy weights. And that's actually not the case. As we'll talk about, the research supports that weights in a very large range of sort of a percentage of your maximum, anywhere from 30 to 80%, so weights that are not very light but are moderately light, too heavy, can cause changes in the connections between nerve and muscle that lead to muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy. Put differently, heavy weights can help build muscle and strength, but they are not required. 
What one has to do is adhere to a certain number of parameters, just a couple of key variables that I'll spell out for you. And if you do that, you can greatly increase muscle hypertrophy, muscle size, and or muscle strength if that's what you want to do. And you don't necessarily have to use heavy weights in order to do that. Now, I'm sure the power lifters and the, the people that like to move heavy weights around will say, no, if you want to get strong, you absolutely have to lift he- heavy weights. And that might be true if you want to get very strong. But for most people who are interested in supporting their muscular such that they offset any age-related decline in strength or in increasing hypertrophy and, and strength to some degree, there really isn't a need to lie about the Henneman size principle, which many people out there are doing, and claiming that you absolutely need to use the heaviest weights possible in order to build strength and muscle. There is a good predictor of how well or how efficient you will be in building the strength and or, if you like, the size of a given muscle. And it has everything to do with those upper motor neurons that are involved in deliberate control of muscle. You can actually do this test right now. You can just kind of march across your body mentally and see whether or not you can independently contract any or all of your muscles. So for instance, if you are sitting in a chair or uh, you're standing, see whether or not you can contract your calf muscle just using those upper motor neurons, sending a signal down and deliberately isolating the calf muscle. Okay. If you can contract the calf muscle hard to the point where that muscle almost feels like it's starting to cramp, like it, it hurts just a little bit. You know, it might, it's not gonna be extremely painful, nor is it gonna have no sensation whatsoever. Chances are you have very good upper motor neuron to calf control. And chances are, if you can isolate that, what they call the brain or mind muscle connection, and you can contract the muscle to the point where it cramps a little bit, that you hold a decent to high potential to change the strength and the size of that muscle if you train it properly. Now, if you have a hard time doing that, chances are you won't be able to do that. If, for instance, you focus on your your uh, back muscle, like we all have these muscles called the, the lat, the latissimus dorsi muscles, which basically are involved in chin-ups and things like that, but their function from a, from a more of a kinesiology standpoint is to move the elbow back behind the body. Okay, so it's not about flexing your bicep, it's about moving your elbow back behind your body. If you can do that mentally, or you can do that physical movement of moving your elbow back behind your body and you can contract that muscle hard, chances are that you have the capacity to enhance the strength and or size of that particular muscle because you have the neural control of that muscle. This is a key feature of the neuromuscular system to appreciate as we begin to talk more about specific protocols. Because everything about muscle hypertrophy, about stimulating muscle growth, is about generating isolated contractions, about challenging specific muscles in a very unnatural way. If you, whereas with strength, it's about using musculature as a system, moving weights, moving resistance, moving the body. The specific goal of hypertrophy is to isolate specific nerve to muscle pathways so that you stimulate the chemical and signaling transduction events in muscles so that those muscles respond by getting larger. So there's a critical distinction in terms of getting stronger versus trying to get muscles to be larger, hypertrophy per se, and it has to do with how much you isolate those muscles. Muscle isolation is not a natural phenomenon. It's not something that we normally do. When we walk, we don't think, okay, right calf contract, left calf contract. No, you just generate those rhythmic movements. And of course, there's no reason for them to get stronger or larger in response to those movements. Let's say you were to do a a kind of strange experiment of attaching 30 pound weights to your ankles and you were to do those movements. Well, if you weren't specifically contracting your calves in each step, there's no reason for the calves to take on the bulk of the work and you would distribute that work across your hip flexors and other aspects of your musculature. Your whole nervous system seeks to gain efficiency. It seeks to spread out the effort. So you can nest this as a principle for yourself, which is if you want to get stronger, it's really about moving progressively greater loads or increasing the amount of weight that you move. Whereas if you're specifically interested in generating hypertrophy, it's all about trying to generate those really hard, almost painful localized contractions of muscle, 
Now, of course, how much weight you use in order to generate those contractions will also impact hypertrophy. But I think most people don't really understand the mind-muscle connection. It sounds like a great thing, but it's actually one of the things you want to avoid if your goal is simply to become more supple or to become stronger. You want to do the movements properly and safely, of course, but it's the opposite of hypertrophy, where with hypertrophy, you're really trying to make that particular muscle, sometimes two muscles, do the majority, if not all the work. Whereas in moving force loads, in trying to generate activity of any kind, like lifting a bar or doing a chin-up or something, those so-called compound movements that involve a lot of muscle groups, if, they're, if your goal is to be better at those, you want to avoid isolating any, any one particular muscle. Now, I know this probably comes across as a kind of a, of a obvious duh, especially to the um, folks that have spent a lot of time in the gym aimed at uh, getting hypertrophy, but I think most people don't appreciate that it's the nerve to muscle connections and the distinction between isolating nerve to muscle connections versus distributing the work of nerve to muscle connections that's vital in determining whether or not you generate hypertrophy, isolated nerve to muscle contractions versus strength and offsetting strength loss, which would be distributed nerve to muscle connection. It also turns out that you can leverage something interesting about exercise and nerve to muscle work in ways that can benefit cognitive function and focus. And it has to do with the way that your body and your nervous system predict bouts of intense focused effort. So let's say you're doing resistance training two or three times a week, maybe even four times a week, and you're doing it consistently at a given time. There are clocks, literally biological clocks within the liver and within the brain that learn to predict that focus and that intense work. If you are trying to get intense cognitive work done, you might try scheduling that cognitive work on the days when you don't do physical training at the same time when you normally would do that intense focused physical training. Because the systems of the body that generate acetylcholine release and other neuromodulators, the systems of the body and brain that generate focused effort those are on this sort of clock mechanism in a way that you likely will find that after just a week of training at regular times, you will be able to focus readily on other things when you're not training, provided you do it during the period of time of day when you normally would train. So this is kind of an indirect positive effect. You're harnessing the focus and the expectation of focus in your nervous system for that particular time of day. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about time of day for training. Turns out that whether or not you do, whether or not you train in the morning or in the afternoon, doesn't really seem to matter for sake of things like hypertrophy and strength, etc. Everyone seems to have a time of day that they prefer to train. I've said before, and there are reasons based on body temperature rhythms and cortisol release that training 30 minutes, three hours or 11 hours after your normal waking time can be very beneficial and can provide a sort of predictability or regularity to when your body will be ready to train and best apt to train well. There is some evidence that training in the afternoon is better for performance, whereas training for body composition changes and strength changes, etc., doesn't really matter when you train. So you also want to make it compatible with sleep, compatible with work. That really gets down into the weeds of optimization. But I think it's interesting to note that if you're going to train at a regular time, you can take the days when you don't train and use that to enhance your cognitive focus for things that have nothing to do with exercise. So this might be writing or reading or music or math, et cetera.